Hello and welcome to 17th Century Tales from Cavalier Newark. My name is Adam Nightingale and I'll be bringing you forgotten stories of Newark's Cavalier past from a secret Nottingham Roundhead location. Episode 1. The Three Sieges of Newark. The first thing you need to understand about Newark during the British Civil Wars is that Newark fought for King Charles I. In fact, it was the only town in the East Midlands that fought for the king during the years 1642 to 1646, and consequently it suffered three increasingly dramatic sieges. But before we get to the good stuff and talk about the fighting, you need to understand why Newark was fanatically loyal to the king in the first place. And in order to do that, we have to go back to the year 1603 and the death of Queen Elizabeth I. As anybody who's ever read a Ladybird history book knows, Queen Elizabeth I died without leaving any children. This meant that there was no direct descendant from the Tudor line to sit on the English throne. Queen Elizabeth I's nearest living relative was James VI, the King of Scotland, son of Mary, Queen of Scots. So. In the space of a single day, James VI of Scotland was now James I, the King of England and Scotland. And rather than ruling from Edinburgh, he needed to make the long journey from Edinburgh to London down the Great North Road. The Great North Road passed through Newark, and so the newly minted King James I of England and Scotland and his entourage stopped in Newark for a little bit of light rest and relaxation. The people of Newark were great hosts and King James was an excellent guest and so a love of Newark was embedded in him which he passed on to his son Charles, future King of England. Charles in his capacity as Prince of Wales and King visited Newark numerous times and Newark sort of fell in love with him. So when war was declared against Parliament in 1642, there was absolutely no doubt in the majority of people in Newark's mind as to who they were going to fight for. It was the king. It was a no-brainer. It was personal. Unfortunately, the same could not be said of the East Midlands towns that surrounded Newark. Nottingham, despite having King Charles I raise his standard there and effectively declare war on Parliament within the confines of their town, the moment the king had left, turned their backs on him and declared for Parliament. Leicester declared for Parliament. Lincoln, although cavalier for a short while at the beginning of the war, was soon overrun and captured by parliamentarians. And Derby, well, what can I say about Derby and the Civil War? Well, it was a bit of a law unto itself technically roundhead, but no one on either side liked or trusted the governor, Sir John Gell. And so the scene was set for three spectacular sieges. But before we get to the fighting, and we will get to the fighting, you need to understand why Newark was so strategically important to both the roundheads and the cavaliers. I've already mentioned one of the reasons, the Great North Road. As a general rule, roads were pretty abysmal in 17th century England, Scotland, Ireland and Wales. Roads were important for transporting supplies, weapons, armies up and down the country. As I already mentioned, the Great North Road linked Scotland with England. There was another road that passed through Newark, an old Roman road called the Foss Way that linked Exeter with Lincoln. So, two of the most important roads in the country more or less crisscross through Newark. In addition to this, the River Trent flowed through Newark and was relatively easy to cross compared with other parts of Nottinghamshire. So, whoever controlled Newark exerted a degree of influence over who used the roads and the river. The Cavaliers had Newark. The Roundheads wanted to possess Newark. And so the stage was set for the Three Sieges. Now we can talk about the fighting. But considering Newark's strategic importance, it has to be said that Newark wasn't that well defended at the beginning of the war. The fortifications were pretty abysmal, and most of the soldiers that had been mustered to defend Newark were almost immediately diverted to help the king in the Edge Hill campaign. And so for a brief moment, Newark was virtually defenceless. And that's when the Roundheads showed up for the first time. 
This wasn't an army, more a raiding party hoping to take advantage of the absence of soldiers for what they believe were easy pickings. Instead of professional soldiers, the Roundheads were met by a crowd of ordinary people from Newark, armed with makeshift weapons. The two sides stood at the bottom of Beacon Hill and stared at each other. And then the Roundheads walked away. To this day, we're not sure why. But they came back a few months later with an army. And so began the first siege of Newark. Siege number one commenced on February the 27th, 1643. 6,000 Roundheads recruited from the surrounding enemy East Midland towns converged on Newark. They brought 10 cannons with them and were led by a soldier of formidable and ferocious reputation called Major General Thomas Ballard. Now, I don't know how long or short you think a siege is supposed to take, and there really is no right or wrong answer. But when I tell you that the first siege of Newark lasted less than two days... Well, one side or the other are clearly not doing their job properly. And you can bet your bottom shilling that it wasn't Newark. The Roundheads were appalling. They made numerous catastrophic mistakes and seemed to lack essential fighting spirit. They put their cannons too far away to actually hit Newark. When, after a little bit of street fighting, they made some headway into the town... They weren't properly reinforced and were often ordered to leave the town and give up the advantage that they had fought to gain. And when the defenders of Newark did the unthinkable and had the temerity to leave their own trenches and actually attack the attackers, the attackers dropped their weapons and ran away. And those few roundheads that did stand and fight and try and hold their ground, their courage was fatally undermined when they ran out of gunpowder and their request for resupply was quite frankly, ignored. It had been an appalling day's fighting for the roundhead attackers. And so, on the 28th of February, rather than reconstitute themselves, lick their wounds and learn from the previous day's mistakes, the besieging army packed up their things and went home. One nil to Newark. So who was responsible for the catastrophic defeat of the roundheads during the first siege of Newark? Well, you know, the defenders of Newark deserve a bit of credit for their spirited resistance, but the blame for the defeat can rest only at one man's shoulders, Major General Thomas Ballard. It was his fault. Which was something of a surprise, as Major General Ballard, as I've mentioned earlier, did, up to that point, have quite a ferocious reputation, earned as a mercenary in the religious wars in Europe and on the battlefields of Edge Hill. Ballard had been promoted to Major General shortly after Edge Hill, and it might simply be a case of someone being promoted above their level of competence. But there are schools of thought that suggest a conspiracy. You see, Major General Ballard wasn't your typical roundhead. He definitely wasn't a Puritan. He liked to drink and was constantly getting in trouble with the more Puritan elements within his own army. He was once snitched on by his own sergeant. A Puritan, of course. The other thing that you need to know about Major General Thomas Ballard is that he had many, many friends within the East Midlands who were also Cavaliers, arguably some of them living in Newark. So there is a school of thought that he threw the battle in a way that a boxer might throw a match in some sort of gambling scandal. Whatever the truth of the matter, the defeat at Newark effectively destroyed Major General Thomas Ballard's military career. And you don't hear much about him throughout the rest of the story of the Civil War, so we're going to leave him there. Newark had clearly fought well during the first siege, but it had also been lucky. And so, in between sieges one and two, it radically beefed up its defences. And a lot of this was due to a visit from royalty. Between sieges one and two, Newark was paid a visit by Queen Henrietta Maria, the wife of King Charles I. She had been sent by her husband on a tour of the continent to raise soldiers. In order to do so, she had borrowed money against the value of her own jewellery and returned to England with four and a half thousand foreign mercenaries. Beset by gales and vicious storms and pursued by the Roundhead Navy, Queen Henrietta Maria disembarked with her mercenary army at Bridlington and marched down the Great North Road. She was on her way to meet her husband and reinforce his army, 
but she stopped off in Newark. And it's a measure of Newark's importance that she left around half her soldiers here to defend the town. Incidentally, when Queen Henrietta Maria stayed in Newark, it's thought that she lodged with Lord and Lady Leake, two of the wealthiest people in the town at the time. Incidentally, Lord and Lady Leake's house can still be seen today. It's the uh, old Tudor house on Kirk Lane. It's been split into two shops. It currently hosts a mattress shop and... Uh, and an art shop, and it used to be the old Charles I coffee house, and that's probably where Queen Henrietta Maria slept. She didn't stay in Newark long, but while she was here, she ordered an assault on Nottingham. Leading the attack was a German mercenary called Baron Dono. We don't know much about him, except he was killed in the attack on Nottingham. He was brought back to Newark and buried in the crypt of the enormous and impressive St Mary Magdalene's Church. His body stayed there until the 19th century, and then the Victorians exhumed his remains along with around 30 other cavalier officers who'd been killed in the span of the three sieges and reburied them in the main garden to the side of St Mary's. And a monument still exists to this day where you can go and literally stand on the remains of Baron Dona and other officers that died defending Newark. Siege number two took place almost exactly a year later. 7,000 roundheads marched against Newark this time, led by a very capable Scottish soldier called Sir John Meldrum. They brought 13 cannons with them, including a large and cumbersome demi-cannon that was so heavy it had to be transported by barge down the River Trent from Hull. The cannon even had a name. It was called Sweet Lips, in honour of a lady of dubious virtue, very popular amongst the gentlemen of Hull. On the 8th of March, Sir John Meldrum tried to take Newark by direct assault, but he failed. His army were pushed back by fierce resistance from the Newark defenders. And so John Meldrum hunkered down to the gruelling business of siege work. In other words, surrounding Newark, completely cutting it off from the outside world and either starving, demoralising, burning or battering it into submission. The cannons went to work, and this time the roundheads actually put them close enough to Newark to hit something. Cannonballs made of iron weighing anything between five pounds and thirty pounds rained on Newark between the hours of twelve midnight and one in the morning. And if cannon fire wasn't bad enough, mortars routinely fired granados over the walls and defences of Newark. Granados were nasty little projectiles made from pottery, packed with gunpowder and designed to burn wooden structures to the ground. In many respects, Granados were more dangerous than cannonballs because Newark was largely constructed from wood, there being only three or four stone buildings in the entire town. What saved Newark from being burned to ashes was the winter. All three sieges took place in particularly severe winters, which kept the wood damp and the roofs damp and stopped the fires really taking hold. Which is not to say there wasn't some damage, because there was. The most famous example is the church spire of St Mary's. A cannonball hit it and knocked a chunk out of the spire. The cannonball hole is still visible today. Sort of. If you stand at the correct angle and look up at the spire from the church gardens, you can see a hole in the church, and at certain angles you can see where the sunlight comes through the hole. But I'm sorry to disappoint people, but that's not the actual cannonball hole. It's far too neat and round. Cannonballs don't make nice round holes. They make jagged holes and rough indents in stone. I mean, there definitely was a cannonball that hit the church spire, but that's not the hole. That hole was put there by the Victorians to commemorate the fact that a roundhead cannonball hit the church spire. The other architectural casualty of the roundhead second siege bombardment is Hercules Clay's house, currently the site of the NatWest Bank in Newark's marketplace. Hercules Clay was a town alderman, a very religious man, who had three dreams during the second siege warning him that Granada would hit his house and burn his house to the ground, roasting him and his family alive. Being a very devout man, he took these dreams as warnings from God. And it's hard to argue with him because when he moved his family out of his house, it was actually hit by a Granada and burned to the ground. Despite the incredible ferocity, resilience and character demonstrated by the defenders of Newark, 
Newark might well have surrendered to Sir John Meldrum had it not been for the intervention of a particularly spectacular cavalier on whom I have to admit I have a little bit of a man crush. I'm talking about Prince Rupert of the Rhine, the nephew of King Charles I and hands down his best soldier on horseback and general of all the king's cavalry. On March the 12th, the king ordered Prince Rupert to relieve Newark. Rupert, as soon as he got his orders, made his way to Chester, where he amassed a force and then went from Chester to Newark, stopping off at sympathetic royalist towns along the way and accruing more soldiers. He avoided all the major roads, travelling across the countryside. Rupert and a force of 6,000 cavaliers arrived in Bingham. Prince Rupert marched his army through the night, and in the early hours of the 21st of March 1644, Prince Rupert took the besieging Roundhead army by surprise. He launched at least two spectacular cavalry charges from Beacon Hill and took on three Roundheads in single combat. The ferocity of Rupert's attack completely overwhelmed the Roundheads who cut and ran and then surrendered a short while later. Rupert was extremely generous in victory. He allowed the Roundheads to leave with their colours and their honour intact. He did disarm them, though, and give most of the weapons to the defenders of Newark, presumably including Sweet Lips, that massive cannon named after that uh, lady of dubious virtue from Hull. Rupert was also said to have disciplined his own soldiers, hitting them with the flat of his sword when he saw that they were trying to loot the Roundhead prisoners. The Siege of Newark was seen by many as the absolute high point in Rupert's military career, and to this day he is something of a lauded hero to the people of Newark, so much so that they named a pub after him, and I can think of no higher honour than that. So the Second Siege of Newark ended 2-0 to Newark. The Cavaliers were doing well, but from this point on, the story gets very, very grim and a little bit depressing. A uh, bit of a trigger warning there for you. But before we brace ourselves for the multiplied miseries heaped upon Newark during the third and final siege, let me just give you a little bit of a postscript to siege number two. The irony of siege number two from the Roundhead's point of view is that Sir John Meldrum actually knew Prince Rupert was coming. But he didn't think Prince Rupert could get there as quickly as he did, so he didn't take the necessary precautions to refortify his defences or check Prince Rupert's advance. What's wrong with these roundhead commanders? In between sieges two and three, Newark beefed up its defences to make it the most fortified it had ever been in its entire history. This included building two fortifications called sconces, named after the king and the queen. That is the king's sconce and the queen's sconce. A sconce is an earthen fortification, Dutch in design. Its purpose is to support the main defences of a town or a city. The queen's sconce still exists. It's in Sconce Park, of course. Where else would it be? After the second siege, having done quite well up to this point, the entire Cavalier Corps started to implode. The main fault or credit for this, depending on your point of view, has to be the reorganisation of the Roundhead Army under the uh, leadership of Sir Thomas Fairfax and Oliver Cromwell. The Cavaliers suffered a humiliating defeat at the Battle of Marston Moor, but that wasn't necessarily the, the, the end of the war for them. The Roundhead's inability to consolidate that victory led to a bit of a power grab. Parliament passed a law called the Self-Denying Ordinance, which effectively sacked the existing commander of the Roundhead forces, Robert Devereux, the third Earl of Essex, and replaced him with the Puritan soldiers, Sir Thomas Fairfax and Oliver Cromwell. Fairfax and Cromwell reorganised the army, turning it into a disciplined, Puritan, religious, fanatical fighting force called the New Model Army. The New Model Army met the King's forces at the Battle of Naseby on the 14th of June 1645 in Northamptonshire. Despite the combined presence on the battlefield of Prince Rupert of the Rhine and the King himself, the Roundheads completely thrashed the Cavaliers. And you could make a point and an argument, and it's a strong argument, that at that point in that battle, the Cavaliers lost the war. Cavaliers didn't help themselves because there was a lot of infighting, especially around the court of King Charles I, and crucially, the king and Prince Rupert, who'd been 
pretty tight BFFs and besties at that point fell out spectacularly. Here in Newark. Rupert had been tasked with defending Bristol. Now, Bristol was an important city because it was the only port still available to the Royalists, and that was the key entry point for resupply of weapons and money and, and whatever you want to resupply an army with. Bristol was a hard city to defend. Rupert knew this firsthand because he'd captured Bristol earlier on in the Civil War. What complicated matters was that plague had broken out in Bristol. Rupert was offered generous terms of surrender by none other than Sir Thomas Fairfax himself, whose army was besieging Bristol. Rupert was in a difficult position. He knew that the king's preference was him to defend Bristol at all costs. He also knew that to stay in Bristol was a, was a bit of a suicide mission and that he would lose many of his men to the plague. Rupert reasoned that if he could negotiate the terms for an honourable surrender, the sort of terms that he offered Sir John Meldrum after he'd captured Meldrum's army at the Second Siege of Newark, then he could leave, albeit minus his weapons, but with his honour and his colours intact, and at the very least live to fight another day. And that's what he did. But that's not how the king interpreted Rupert's actions. The king interpreted Rupert's actions as those of a coward and a traitor and an incompetent. This wasn't strictly the king's idea, it has to be said. He had an advisor whose opinions he was quite partial to at that point in the Civil War. The advisor was George Digby. And the problem from Rupert's point of view with George Digby was that George Digby hated Rupert's guts and saw this as a perfect opportunity to stick the knife in and get rid of a hated political rival. Consequently, Prince Rupert was placed under house arrest in Oxford and Rupert being Rupert, he just ignored the conditions of his house arrest and left Oxford and sought a reckoning with the king. Now, the reason that I'm telling you all of this is that the king was in Newark at this point in the war, staying with the military governor of Newark, Lord John Bellasize. The governor's house still exists today, and it's, well, it's a Greg's. It's the site of Greg's, the one in the marketplace. The king of England stayed at Greg's. Greg's. Extraordinary. Can you believe it? Rupert and an armed entourage fought their way across Northamptonshire, Leicestershire and Nottinghamshire and arrived in Newark. They rode across the marketplace. Rupert dismounted and without changing his clothes or prettifying himself, walked into the governor's house and had a stand-up argument in the presence of the king with Digby. And swords were drawn between Rupert's followers and Digby's followers. If that wasn't enough, Rupert quarrelled face to face with the king and insisted on a court's martial to clear his name. The results of the court's martial exonerated Rupert up to a point. He was cleared of the most serious charges of treason and cowardice, but was found guilty of having unsound judgment. He wasn't happy and left Newark in something of a rage. And, and it is said that the king, once all of this was over, broke down and wept in the governor's house, here in Newark. After the argument, the king left Newark. It was the last time the people of Newark would ever see their beloved king in the flesh. But King Charles I would resurface one final time and directly influence the fate of Newark. The Third Siege of Newark was the longest. It lasted six months, commencing on the 26th of November 1645 and finishing on the 8th of May, 1646. By the time the Third Siege commenced, Newark's population was as big as it had been during the war. This was largely due to the host of soldiers that had occupied Newark for one last stand in the name of their king. With the addition of the two new sconces and numerous extra fortifications, Newark was as well defended as it had ever been. But coming against Newark was the biggest army it had encountered Oh, there were the usual suspects from the surrounding East Midlands towns, but soldiers came up from London and Scotland in the form of the Presbyterian Covenanter Army. At the height of the siege, in total, 17,000 roundheads surrounded Newark. If you want to see physical evidence as to how intense the fighting got at times, go down to the River Trent towpath and stand beneath the castle wall. You'll be able to see hundreds and hundreds of pockmarks created by cannonballs fired over the River Trent by the Scottish Covenanter army. 
But historians tend not to see the third siege of Newark in terms of tales of heroism on the battlefield. Unlike the second siege of Newark, which is pretty much defined by Prince Rupert's spectacular, but often romanticised gallop down Beacon Hill. No, historians tend to view the third siege in view of the effect that the siege had on the civilian population and the terrible things that they had to endure. But the people of Newark were pretty well prepared for a third siege. I mean, goodness knows they'd had enough practice. For example, if you lived outside of the siege defences, unfortunately you were evicted from your home, forced to billet with someone else, and your house was demolished in order to deny the roundheads cover. The people of Newark, in anticipation of a time when money might run out and the economy might grind to a halt, made their own money. The money was made in a mint in the castle, and it was made largely from silver that had actually been looted from Leicester. Sorry, Leicester, but it was a long time ago. I hope you forgive us. The money was weirdly shaped, not round like a normal coin, but diamond shaped. And this was because when you cut out coins from a flat piece of silver, if you're using circles, there will be space in between the circles. But if you use diamond shapes, there is no space and there's no waste of silver. The money never ran out, so the coins were never used. Food looked like it might run out, which was normal in a long siege, and so people had to get very creative in what they ate. Some of the soldiers ate horses. In at least one instance, a man ate his dog. Now, don't get all high and mighty. Pretend you wouldn't do exactly the same thing. We don't know until we're put to the test. And don't knock it till you've tried it. Mmm. Dog burger. During the Third Siege, the winter was particularly cold, even by normal Arctic Civil War siege standards. But the people got on with it. This was their new reality. They adapted, they got on with their business, and they thrived. In fact, during the sieges, marriages spiked to an all-time high. The most severe trial to beset the people of Newark during the Third Siege, and one might argue the darkest chapter in Newark's history, was the outbreak of the plague. In the winter months of the Third Siege, people started to die of typhus, a disease spread by overcrowding and filthy living conditions. By the time spring came around, an outbreak of the plague joined typhus in claiming one in seven of the population of Newark. That's 1,000 people from a population of 7,000. If you caught the plague, you were forced to isolate yourself in your house and people were delivered bread to your doorstep. Sound familiar? You died of the plague, especially later on in the siege. They couldn't bury you individually in a grave, and so people were buried in mass graves, the location of which is still a little bit of a mystery. In spite of the enormous risk, many of the people of Newark exhibited extraordinary courage, treating those afflicted with the plague. But even the plague couldn't force the people of Newark to surrender. The only thing that would do that would be an order from the king. And that order came on the 8th of May, when news reached the population of Newark that the king had been captured by the Scottish Roundheads, occupying the nearby town of Southwell. Finally, Newark was forced to surrender to the Roundheads. Game set and match to Parliament. The Roundheads entered Newark, but they only stuck around for about a day or so because of the plague. Had they stayed, what they would have done was they would have completely destroyed the castle, they would have levelled the sconce, they would have absolutely vandalised St Mary Magdalene's church, believing it to be far too Catholic for Puritan tastes. As it stood, they did do a little bit of damage. They exploded one keg of gunpowder in the gatehouse of the castle. They smashed some stained glass windows and destroyed a baptismal font in St Mary's church. You can still actually see the crack where the original damage was done before it was restored to its former glory in 1660 at the restoration of Charles II. The irony of the Third Siege is that because of the plague, the Roundheads didn't stick around very long, and so consequently they didn't destroy all of the features that they would normally level after occupying a town in the aftermath of a siege. Consequently, many of the things that distinguish Newark as a Civil War town of great historical interest have survived, thanks to the plague, bizarrely. After everything it had been through, Newark found itself on the losing side in the Civil War, but it could take an enormous degree of pride in the fact that it was one of the last towns fighting for the king to surrender. If you think about it, Newark held out longer than the king did. 
But that's not the real legacy of the Siege of Newark. The real legacy is that the town survived everything its enemies and nature could throw at it, like we are doing and will continue to do. Thank you for listening to 17th Century Tales from Cavalier Newark. Written and presented by Adam Nightingale from a secret location in Roundhead, Nottingham. Check the Learning From Home free resources page on the National Civil War Centre and Newark Museum website for new episodes and other amazing resources. I can tell you now that the next episode will feature three brothers from a divided household, the Hacker Brothers. See you then, and stay safe.